Hello, welcome to episode two of The Habitus. My name is Michael Patterson. I'm here once again with co-host Bobby Lowe. Bobby, uh, I watched recently a film that on your recommendation, uh, because you were speaking, waxing a lyrical about this film when I saw you in Dublin earlier this year, um, Angst, otherwise known as Fear, uh, the 1983 Austrian uh, horror film, let's say, um, by Gerald, Gerald Cargill, um, 1983. Uh, Who never made another film. You never made another film. Because of the failure and because of the controversy around angst. How did you come to see angst in the first place? Actually, uh, I, to... I just just randomly I was I was uh, working my way through the highest rated horror films on IMDb, and it was one of the it was one of them, and it was yeah. seventy two minutes or something like that. I threw it on with very very low expectations, yeah. and uh, yeah, it, it's very quickly became one of my favorite films. Um, I should just, should say that that the title. Uh, when I first watched it, I I didn't know that angst means fear in German. <clears throat> so I was, you know, halfway through the film, I was thinking, I mean, is this not a huge understatement? Uh, like, this character is feeling angst when he's, like, butchering and terrorizing these people. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the title translates as fear, and it, it refers to, obviously, the victim's experiences. But uh, uh, Although it unfolds from the perspective um of the main protagonist who is the killer mm-hmm. um and played by Irvin Leder um a really really great performance um and the protagonist is a uh, protagonist he's been in prison protagonist maybe the, the subject yes i mean um, uh yeah i mean we're certainly not asking no, to we're identify rooting for him uh, um uh, which is actually the, pre- the opening premise of the film, because I think it, it very quickly it has a, a voiceover narration. Uh, he's released from prison. Uh, we see the mm-hmm. meticulous process of him being released uh, from prison, being led through corridors uh, upon corridors. Yeah, he's been in for, I think, seven years for attempt- the attempted murder of his mother. Which is all explained to us by him in voiceover, right? And, yeah, in, uh, in kind of, in kind of uh, self-aggrandizing voiceover. Yeah, um, and then... He's released and he announces uh, very early on that he has a compulsion to kill again. And he makes the t- mm-hmm. conscious decision that he's going to do so. So, like, Immediately, yeah. Um, from the very start, we know what we're in for, uh, I think, in terms of a premise. But we mm-hmm. don't really sure how far it's going to go in terms of its graphic depiction yeah. of what's going to come. The film was actually banned all over Europe for its extreme mm-hmm. depiction of violence uh, in 1983, which no mm-hmm. doubt uh, added to the director's decision not to make another film. Yeah, uh, I think, I mean, firstly, before we get to the actual violence that happens on screen, it's a wonderfully, wonderfully shot film uh, mm-hmm. by uh, shot by uh, Zbigniew Rubzinski I think I said that right uh, he was a Polish filmmaker uh, experimental animator um, and he co-scripted the film as well with uh, Cargill and um, his imprint the visually is very very strong in the opening moments like every scene seems to be shot either from an extreme low angle or an extreme high angle as they're going through the prison uh, yeah. so it kind of announces itself as this grandiose very stylized aesthetic I believe the opening shot is a is an extremely high crane shot. Yes. Which it, it looks almost impossible. It it must be I think the crane must be mounted on an adjacent building. Well, I mean, today it would be a drone shot, it's, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It, but it's it's it looks like it's 12, 15 stories up. Absolutely. And it descends um, upon uh, into the uh, prison grounds if I'm, yeah. 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 Um and so this this ultra highly stylized aesthetic um is immediately off balanced by the fact that where we're having a very sort of um, extremely graphic uh, compulsion expressed to us in a very banal way. Um, so there's this mm-hmm. everyday uh, banality to everything uh, in terms of the emotional content of the film, and yet this extremely and even the color palette of the film too. Absolutely, um, and um, I mean, I think it was shot in Vienna. Uh, I've been to Vienna. Like the, the autumnal light there is it's a camping encapsulated so well in the image of the film and the texture of the film it's like got this sort of um, how to put it like a a white fogginess to it that like that doesn't limit vision uh, 
but mm-hmm. uh, the whole sort of city or the town which he's navigating seems to, I don't know, suggest a, a, a whiteness uh, that, again, seems to be at odds with uh, what's going on in the guy's head. Yeah. <clears throat> um, this is uh, one of the two films that Gaspar and Noah uh, cites as his, his you know, major formative influences along with uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, um, which is, uh, uh, I, well, it's actually a source of great frustration for me because when I was watching Love, I was just thinking, man, your, your two favorite films are this incredible science fiction film and this incredible horror film, and this is what you're producing. Um, when you could, I mean, it's clear like that he could be making amazing horror films or amazing science fiction films, and instead he's making films like Love. But anyway... Um, I actually hadn't heard that until after I'd seen the film. I, I heard him talking about angst, uh, and you can see that. And we'll, we'll get into uh, a certain uh, scene that is homaged in in, uh, in uh, Irreversible um, when, when we get to that scene. Yeah, I mean, uh, so firstly, he's like he's looking for a victim to kill immediately. Yeah, on, and, on, on his uh, release. Yeah, there's this great, great kinetic energy to the film from as we said, like the, the grace and eloquence with which the whole thing is shot, um, mm-hmm. which I don't know, positions us in a very weird uh, mindset when we're watching a film because it's a very beautiful film to watch. It's like, you know, awesome. Uh, and then we kind of keep on watching as we do when we watch films. Uh, and then, you know, we're aware of something horrible is going to happen. And so it becomes a kind of a... Almost a home invasion movie, right? Like, uh, so right. He, so the first, the first thing that he does, yeah. But before that, the first thing that he does is he goes to a diner and he orders uh, a sausage and mustard, and he eats the sausage, and uh, in a way that's almost reminiscent of the way that people eat in Jan Svankmer films. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of like lip smacking and like it's very sort of tactile. You can hear all the saliva and the chewing and everything. Uh, and while he's doing this, he's kind of frenetically sort of eyeing all of the people in the diner and trying to select a victim. He has his eye on these two young women at the counter and uh he's so obviously uh out of place and he's he's so conspicuously um uh agitated and furtive that that uh everybody is kind of watching him or at least at least he sees it that way he sees everybody looking at him yeah uh you know maybe maybe that's supposed to be a, a sort of just his subjective perception um but then he leaves the diner and he gets into a taxi and uh he attempts to murder the taxi driver but it's a terribly bungled attempt. Um, she sees what's about to happen before it happens. Yeah. Um, and uh, she manages to fight him off, and he flees into the into the woods. And then, yeah, he happens across what looks to be an empty house. and uh, Which he chooses as his perfect setting <clears throat> for what's about to unfold. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the scene in the taxi anticipates, I think, the, the, the murder in... Uh, the short a short film about killing the Kuzlowski film, um, in which which is also uh, a, a kind of a long, uh, horrible, uh, brutal depiction of violence. You know, I've never seen that one. You've never actually seen it. No, oh, wow. I've only seen I've only seen the first three episodes of the Decalogue. Oh wow! I've never seen. Uh, it's worth getting to episode five. Yeah. So yeah, all of this is happening, and um, it's also unfolding the film uh, to a, a great, wonderfully, again, kind of out of sync uh, soundtrack, mm-hmm. uh, which, like the, the visual component of the film, is so heavily sort of stylized uh, by Carl Schultz, or Schultz, um, which is very synth, uh, synth like and percussive. And, uh, you know, it's like this guy's walking through a, a dream of his own making. Um, it's also like so, yeah. it's also a bit like a nineteen eighties action film, the soundtrack in a way. I think. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, and then, so he, you know, he comes upon the house, and um, I should say that the uh, the disconnection between the the reason the reason that I say the uh, his his experience of being observed by people in the diner might just be intended to be his uh, his own sort of um, narcissism uh, is that in the taxi it becomes clear that his his internal monologue is it is this kind of self 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 aggrandizing narrative of him as this uh great hunter and predator and murderer um and master criminal but in reality he's not in reality uh it's it's a little bit similar to um 
the scene, the famous murder scene, and not murder scene, but the famous this famous uh, scene in, Tor- in Torn Curtain, mm. uh, where Paul Newman is is trying to kill the guy, and he's trying to kill him, and it, it goes on and on and on. Yeah. And it, it's sort of uh, you know it's heralded for you know showing how difficult it can be to kill somebody. Um, not that I have any experience with that, but um, nor me. That's sim- <laughs> just go on the record there. Um, similar to. Uh, yeah, so so. <clears throat> but it's, in, it's also in, the very thing that, that Casino Royale was praised for as well, because uh, you know all of a sudden we had a scene in which James Bond struggled to kill somebody, and it's like oh, yeah, showing right, yeah. like violence and death is this thing of consequence, and I think that's the the uh, the, the key sort of uh, strength and intrigue of this film. You know, it is centered around a horrific act of violence or violences. Um, and yet it does show violence to be this horribly uh, protracted thing. It's a thing of consequence. Yeah. Um, but also, I think it's it's darkly comic, too. It is. I that, mean... that dis- The disconnection and his self-aggrandization aggrandiz- yeah. uh, is, um, is, is at times quite funny. I mean, it's a, um, it's a great performance by Irvin Ledar as well. I mean, uh, he mm-hmm. cuts this yeah. pathetic, uh, almost golem-like figure... Um, <laughs> And uh, funnily enough, the film was, uh, when it was released in France in 2012, it was called Schizophrenia. That was the translation. Um, Now, I don't know, do you find that there's a a problem in its depiction of of a psychopath who inevitably murders somebody? Um, Is that something that you you never really kind of resonates with you when you watch it? How do you mean? I mean, the... it could be. Argue, I mean, it could be argued that it's a kind of problematic uh, reading of uh, mental illness, right? That it kind of yeah. justifies his acts, uh, and it's a kind of like a hysterical take on you know a person who's categorised as a psychopath. Right. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, it could be. I. I mean, I. I don't. I generally would re- reject the idea that uh, a character who fits into a particular social category must represent that category so if he is a psychopath that he must represent people who are psychopaths or <clears throat> that he's if he's mentally ill he must represent people who are mentally ill yeah um yeah which i, I just don't see any, any any logical reason to make that assumption even though it is a, a popular uh critical um orientation these days and it should be uh, noted i think uh that this film is is in part of its controversy was that it was the the character uh, is based upon a real life actual murderer, a uh, serial killer, in fact. Uh, Werner Knesiak, uh, I think, is the, mm-hmm. is the guy who it's, it's based on. Okay. Um, which I think sort of. I mean, you don't have to know that to watch this film and get something from it. Uh, and my question is then do you think knowing that, or do you think the fact that the film is based. Uh, upon these kinds of actual events, do you think that complicates the, the, the kind of ethics of representing such violence? Um, well, I should say on that point that the uh, there are two cuts of the film. Mm-hmm. So there's the seventy uh, six minute cut, I think. And That's then the one I saw. There's, right, yeah, that was that was one that I saw first, yeah. <clears throat> and then um, the one that I later saw before I realized that there were two cuts was an eighty five minute cut it's about nine eight or nine minutes longer right uh and all of that is at the beginning there's a, a long preamble uh that is presented as um kind of a like a documentary right about uh this character not the not the real um you know person that the character is inspired by but the like treating this character as um somebody who really committed crimes in this in this area at this time and uh i mean it, it really doesn't add to the film aesthetically or dramatically at all it's it's it seems to be there to puncture that hermetically sealed psychopathic perspective that the film otherwise takes mm-hmm. and um that's that's what it feels like it feels i don't know if it was added afterwards um if the film was seen as kind of too uh too intense and too myopic but yeah it it, it kind of gives you a lot of backstory that is redundant because it's the backstory that you're then given in his own words about how he how he killed his mother how he, yeah. like the the fear in her eyes when the knife entered her body and that kind of stuff that's all uh in in this preamble um but it would be interesting to know if that was something that was added afterwards after the film which of the two cuts um, uh is cargill in favor of the shorter the shorter, the shorter cut is the, the shorter cut is the director's cut um and the, um, 
even the director's cut uh, ends with a voiceover of a medical record being read out that kind of oh, that's true, yeah. Yeah. him uh, as mm-hmm. uh, a killer who was driven to do what he did um, through it links it to his upbringing and his childhood I think and the traumas relating to that um, I don't know like I, I, I asked a friend recently if he had seen a film and he had and he said it was you know very good but he also had a problem with the voiceover he said uh, it's kind of embarrassing was, was the word he used. I think it's important for the voiceover to be there, actually, because I think it's another structural component in the film that complicates the um, dramatic irony of the whole thing. Like, we know that he's got this compulsion. We know that it's, you know, it's it's kind of, it's acting also as a device in the film of, uh, by which to say, if you're not into this now, at the sound of it, get out. Um, it's giving kind of people a warning in textual terms. Um which brings us to the murder itself, or the murders, should we say. Um, right, so the the family consists of uh, four, is that right? Four three. people? <clears throat> three. Oh, is there only yeah. three? Yeah, there are only three. Yeah, you're right, there are only three. And it's intergenerational, um, right? So you've got um, a woman mm-hmm. um, who lives there with her mother and her son. Yes. Uh, and her son? Yes. Her, bro- her brother. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. The the, the man in the wheelchair yeah. is, her, is her brother, I presume. The, yeah, it's the mother and, and her... The mother and her her son and daughter. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and he uh, and the son is in a wheelchair. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and the mother has some sort of medical condition as well. Uh, yeah, she requires. Uh, she has like a heart tickets, a heart condition yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Um, and they're coming in from uh, a, a daily shop, it seems. Uh, at which point, the film kind of descends into literal darkness because it's evening, um, and the the you know. The character, let's say, not the, if not the protagonist, uh, is in is already in the house. He's uh, holed up and he's waiting for them. Um, right. And so, when the central act of violence in the full ensues, uh, and it's, I mean, it's, it's. I was watching it, you know, and I'm thinking, uh, this is a this is a director who knows how to construct um, scenes just in terms of simple blocking, right? And like mm-hmm. the architecture of the house and how that like lends itself to this kind of bungled clumsiness with which the guy carries out his, his murders um, and he's going from one room to the next and he's trying to kind of orchestrate everything um, that he needs to control. Yeah, he's as, he's as far he's as far from, from the uh, sort of archetypal Hannibal Lecter psychopath as you could get. He's he's driven entirely by uh, his, his passionate impulses um, and he, he hasn't, he doesn't have a plan. <clears throat> you know, he's, he's kind of just like living moment, moment by moment. Yeah. Uh, so he, what he does is he, uh, of 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 his three victims, the one most capable of defending herself is the daughter. So he he ties her, he tapes her uh, leg, which is a, is a really strange and unusual choice. Uh, you know, he he takes her ankle and he tapes her ankle to the the handle. the handle of the door. Yeah, um, and and he he must tape her hands also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> she has one leg suspended and she's lying on the ground with her hands tape behind her back and then he proceeds to uh, murder the the other two people he drowns the um the guy from the uh, it is her brother isn't it it's not her father no 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 it's definitely not because uh right right yeah. okay yeah. it's like our older brother or yeah. something yeah so uh he, he's incapacitated he it. anyway um through you know his yeah. own physical difficulties, and so he has to sort of drag him upstairs into the bathroom, oh, yeah. which becomes this and again this like really protracted sequence. And, and, right. and again, I think I would agree with you that it's kind of like darkly comic as well, because it's like mm-hmm. a, it's almost like a, a Buster Keaton scenario where he's trying to yeah. uh, you know control all of these different interconnected elements. And, and it's a, it's a vein of it's a vein of dark comedy that is that is very subterranean. You know, like you can totally understand somebody seeing it and not seeing the comedy. And I feel the same way about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right. where there is this jet black streak of comedy in there. So, and again, it's it's rooted in that kind of uh, how ungainly everything is. Yeah. Um, there's no real elegance or or uh, cunning to anything that's going on. It's just this uh, sort of uh, frenzy and and uh, kind of like un- unleashed. Id. Yeah, which is heightened into this hysterical uh, fashion through the camera work as well. Because when I was watching it, I was like simultaneously admiring the camera work and also admiring the fact that Cargill, you know, kind of throwing this film together 
um, you know, there's continuity errors, like just basic stuff, like in a scene like uh, like the mother who requires pills at some point, and so like he has to kind of because the fact is that he wants to keep uh, his victims alive to watch the others suffer, and actually like kills them almost prematurely uh, and by mistake, almost through his own kind of blundering ways, and. Um, there are continuity errors, so like for instance, when uh, you know he props the mother up somehow, like her corpse up against the shelves in the house, and like we we cut back to her and like she's in a com- almost a completely different position. And I love the fact that it's got those kind of uh, rusty edges to it, although it's got this highly stylized uh, architecture in the way it's shot and filmed. Um, yeah. There's also this kind of uh, you know. The sensibility where we're just going to make the film we want to make and it's not going to be too polished uh which kind of adds to its uh its appeal to me almost yeah yeah definitely yeah um so he how does he kill the mother the mother dies of a heart attack doesn't she or does he give he, he over i can't remember he doesn't really end up doing a whole lot to her she dies because she's in need of pills that's right, yeah. Um, and then, so that leaves just the daughter who uh, escapes through the uh, the screen door. She smashes it and, and runs out into the... We should say the house is, is quite isolated. It's uh, it's like a relatively large house in its own grounds uh, with, um, like, on, on the edge of a forest. Yeah, and it's got... S- there, are na- there are neighbors, but they seem to be... Uh, quite far away and it seems to be a kind of a quiet neighborhood and it's got uh, several entrances and escape routes let's say uh, and one could say you know that there's a sort of a um, it's it's st- it's strategic in this way it's built into the very architecture of the house that there's this tension there is she going to get away and if so by which route and her advantage is that she knows the grounds of the house intimately and the killer doesn't right. um, yeah. but, so it kind of culminates this whole protracted dark comical sequence in a sort of underground passageway uh, and you know we're treated to this uh, extremely brutal depiction of um, you know he, he cuts her throat, he stabs her he drinks her blood uh, and then he rapes her corpse Right and this is the scene that, that Gaspar Noah homages in Irreversible with the infamous uh, rape scene in the in the underpass, yeah. the pedestrian underpass, uh, with Monica Bellucci, uh, like really the 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 recreation of the imagery, like sans the blood, is uh, is really, you know, very obvious and, and striking. Yeah. Um, uh, and also, obviously, the fact that Monica Bellucci is not is not killed. I mean, in the No Way film, uh, uh, there's a there's a redness to the underpass that kind of uh, mm-hmm. undercuts its otherwise heightened reality. In angst, it's all very grey and blue. The colour palette, yeah, yeah, and um, it's yeah. it's very we're, we're kind of drawn to through the very texture of the grainy image to the concreteness of it, and the concreteness of the situation. Because until now, like as we've mentioned, it's been a bit like a blundering sort of thing. All of right, a it very abruptly it very abruptly stops being even remotely. Yes, funny. I yeah. mean it's absolutely uh, like horrific, uh, and we're, it's, it's a terrifying scene. Yeah, it is. It it then cuts to him hours later like satiated and uh lying on top of her with his pants down and uh covered in like dry blood there's blood everywhere like splattered all over the walls um and i i mean i was saying to you before that this scene is just like it's one of my favorite scenes yeah i mean in, in, it's worth in talking film. about because um, it's incredibly I thought powerful. the film itself was great. I'm not really drawn to those kinds of scenes as like, um, you know, in touch with my, let's say, general film watching sensibility. Um, I, I don't watch that many horror films. I certainly wouldn't have come to this film through IMDb's R rated list, for instance, like you did. Um, I wanted to know really why that scene in, in particular is one of for you the best ever made or shot. Um, it's the it's the combination of the brutality and the the nihilism, uh, the the sense of of uh, the like brutal, violent ending of, of somebody's life, uh, 
and also the the objectification of her like the extreme objectification of a person uh to the level of being literally an object being being like being made prey of someone else like being um preyed upon <clears throat> um i don't know it's just the combination of of the that pathos and that intensity is is just um i don't know it just hits me very very hard uh and we're, I mean, we're going to talk about that in relation to some yeah, other films. I mean, uh, um, it's also the point, at that point in the film, I think it's been a while since we've heard the voiceover. Um, and so it, all of a sudden, our sort of reading of the film, our proximity to it, is, I think, complicated. And we're all of a sudden very aware of this abrupt shift into territory that is very, very cold, very, very blunt and brutal. And we're also made aware of, through the silence of the film, this comparative silence uh, of a body. So again, this like this this idea of death as a consequence, um, and a large part of that, I think, is compounded by the fact that the subsequent sequence is this kind of like exasperatingly protracted one in which he then has to orchestrate his own escape with the three corpses. So he's going back and forth mm-hmm. into the house, up multiple stories, up and down, um, along this passageway with the two other corpses into the back of the car, trying to kind of, Im- again, improvise him- his way out of a situation. And, you know, we're, we're, we're made to watch this whole uh, process and it becomes a very physically, it's, it's physically exhausting for him but it's also kind of mentally draining for us to watch because, you know, the film could just end there, but it doesn't. It, it, it decides to kind of go on. And, that, like, we're just... We become very aware of, like, the logistics for him to kind of have it... Uh, to, and the... And the, and the um, not only the logistics, but the, you know, the physical kind of uh, drain that it's had on him. And we've got these high shots um, of the household, of the property, and uh, the kind of, I think it's kind of a a very small pond, or sorry, a large pond or a very small lake (laughs) at the the property. Um, And it's, as I said, it's autumnal. So the whole thing's got a chilly vibe to it. Um, And then there's a kind of, after that, a symmetry, uh, because it goes back to the, eventually goes back to the opening diner where he had a sausage. Uh, with mustard, yeah. Um, but by which point, obviously, he's covered in blood. He's tried to clean that again through this. Right, he's changed. Yeah. He's changed his clothes and, and washed yeah. washed his face and all. But he's yeah, he's, he's still he's even more conspicuous Absolutely. now than he was at yeah. the beginning. And then, so that you've got this return, this gradual, subtle return of a of a very comical element, I would say. But the stakes mm. are changed yeah. um, because there was still through the kind of Buster Keaton like episode earlier, there was still hope that. You know his victims, who we have no real attachment to or investment in, we're going to escape, right? Now it's completely yeah. changed because he's got three bodies in the back of his car, and all of a sudden it just feels very serious. Yeah, I, I actually I love um, the idea of um, that kind of the 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 gaps in in uh, society where if you decide to live outside of laws or mores um how you navigate that you know so like one of the reasons that i love the uh the fugitive uh the the harrison ford one um is is that the first half of the film where he is a fugitive like before he starts to kind of proactively try to solve the the case that he's you know but uh when when he's just trying to like slip through the cracks he's like goes into the hospital and you know pretends to be a doctor and shaves his beard and and, like all all these little these tactics that he has to employ to to stay outside of uh the law and you get that. I mean, that's obviously a very different context, but you get that in this as well. It's like, well, it doesn't actually go so, go that far, but it's um, like what he has to do. He has to clean it up. He has to get the bodies out of there, and he has to like, where is he going? Yeah. What's he going to do? You know. And ultimately, it doesn't get that far <clears throat> because uh, he gets uh, well. He gets he, caught. Also, he acts without forethought. The only forethought he has in the film is that he's going to kill. That's his one compulsion, and uh, he's made up yeah. his mind with regard to that. But in terms of like, what comes next? There isn't really a plan, mm-hmm. but I, I'm also a fan of those kinds of films where, like, um, it's structured into the premise. Like, you know, I, I think that's 
the the uh, chief strength of the Bond films for me. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, so you know, t- typically in a serial killer story, you get the police's perspective. You know, actually, this is uh, in relation to uh, kind of a similar film to Angst, actually, Henry Portrait of a mm-hmm. Serial Killer. Uh, one of the controversies around that film at the time was that we didn't get the police's perspective, and uh, John McNaughton, what's yeah. his name, isn't it? John McNaughton uh, says that when the film premiered, that, that that's what people were saying to him was that like, you can't make a film where we just follow the killer and, and there's no there's no police perspective, there's no cop like pursuing him or any anybody that yeah. we can identify with. And he was like, well, why not? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, typically you get. I mean, you do like you if you if you get the serial killer's perspective, it's it's generally going to be somebody like Hannibal Lecter, who's you know like cunning yeah. and charming. But uh, to get an actual like study of a ser- like the, the kind of the day to day life of yeah. a serial killer, um, I actually love it. I mean, I I've, I've realized um, when I was watching uh, recently watching Deranged, the 1974 yeah. Deranged, uh, starring Robert's Blossom. Uh-huh. Uh, best known for playing uh, old man, yeah. old man Marley, old isn't Marley. in in Home Alone? <clears throat> yeah, um, he's he's starring as a kind of a um, Ed Ed Gein proxy Robert character. Robert Blossom uh, plays a serial killer. Wow, I need to mm-hmm. see this film. Yeah, uh, so he, he but it, I, I love um, character studies of, of of characters who are just left alone uh, with their own kind of mania their own like alternate reality and left to kind of um you know create like externalize all of their their uh, strange impulses and create like you know i mean the ed gein house was famously like referred to as a house of horrors and you know like when you went inside it's uh, like the texas chainsaw massacre where they made furniture out of human yeah. bones and or even like the jeffrey dahmer kind of thing where he he was creating in his apartment yeah. <laughs> it's amazing that it was an apartment but uh he was creating an altar uh, he wanted like f- like human skeletons, and he wanted to sit there and have severed heads mm-hmm. on the desk, and like just to give himself like a, a kind of a it was like his version of a man cave, you know, uh, where he could uh, kind of collect his thoughts and, and be at peace, and that kind of thing where people are just left alone and that kind of solitary life of a of a of a serial killer, and you know, it's it's so. Um, it's so opaque, you know. Like we don't, we can't see into their lives at all, and yet there's something really profound about that kind well, of behavior. Well, there's an ultimate disconnect, um, right, between what we see and what we understand, because at some point it just does become unfathomable. It's not, it's not understood socially. It's not, ex, it's not explicable, or ex, uh, you know, it's not self-explanatory, and it. And it you can only go so far, like, you know, I was thinking just getting away maybe from serial killers for a moment, and Ed Gein, like, although we're definitely going to come back to it, when I was watching Angst, I was actually also reminded of another Austrian debut feature, uh, Michael Haneke's The Seventh Continent, uh, mm-hmm. which uh, came out six years after Angst did, and it's a film in which a petty bourgeois family, over the course of uh, three years, I think, um, decide to kill themselves. It's a family suicide, uh, and they take their young uh, daughter with them. And it's—I uh, mean—it's a brutal film. I watched it recently or earlier this year in Woods. Uh, sorry, did you say that? Sorry, did you say that it takes place over three years? Yeah, I think it's—it's it's in three parts. Nineteen, and it's nineteen eighty-seven to nineteen eighty-nine. Okay, but it, when when. Uh... Their their decision is triggered by the girl pretending to be blind, isn't that right? Yes and no. I mean, it's it's a film in which it's unlike. Not Angst. that that, no, I don't mean that that's the explanation, but that's in in the context of the story. That's like the catalyst, isn't it? I mean, I think that scene could be read as such, but it's also a film that's structured in such a way that ultimately we don't really know why they make the decision to kill themselves. Oh no, I know that. I mean, but it is in in terms of the in terms of the three year structure, is yeah. the the girl's pretense at the beginning? Of yeah, that? yeah, it's very right. it's yeah. very early on. But that that all that could also just be read as um, her a symptom of her isolation and feelings of such within the family household. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And alienation. Yeah. And so 
this is a film that I suppose, unlike Angst, I mean, there's no voiceover here to explain the men- internal mechanisms that would lead up to this kind of inexplicable event. And we should say that this is also based upon an actual family, because Haneke was inspired by a newspaper article to make this film. Um, right. And so, unlike Angst, as I said, there's no real kind of uh, attempt to psychologise it. In fact, it, it very much is a very anti-psychological film in that respect. It's a very controlled, very restrained film. Um, and it's got this really weird sense of dread very early on anyway. Um, because the, the, the scenes are very, very fractured. It's, it unfolds in a very fragmented manner. Um, we're not really sure why we're being told what we're being told. And then in the third part of the film, it comes to light that actually they're killing themselves um, and they're planning it thoroughly and meticulously. You know, they're, they're not only killing themselves, but they're making it very difficult um, to be for themselves to be found. Like they think ahead, like, you know, they phone the, the school of their daughter to tell them that she's going to be off for a t- certain amount of time, they disconnect their phone, they pay their bills, you know, they, they have a, a, a they feast on a banquet. Um, and it's just, it's just this pile up of um, different elements that as a whole, don't really make any sense. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you feel at the end of that film? Absolutely like distraught, like I've been completely walloped over the head by something that I just yeah. don't understand. But I feel very, I, can't, I, re- I remember watching I it. Yeah, as a visceral experience, it's. I mean, I'd seen it years ago, and I thought it was you know tremendous film. But then watching it on the big screen in Woods, it was like, wow, this is like, and and to to consider it, you know, as a as a debut film as well. I mean, what a film. Um, yeah, he had he'd worked in, in he'd made a lot of telly films. Yeah, before of that, course, hadn't. but like you know, even so, yeah. this was yeah. Um, he kind of separates it from the rest of his filmography. Actually, he says he refers to it as a um, infernal, infernal machine okay. or something like that. Um, that it was it's like an engine designed to produce a particular emotional effect. Uh, and yeah, I remember I haven't seen it in years either. I saw it maybe ten years ago, but I remember sitting there when it ended because I didn't know how it ended. I didn't I didn't I hadn't read any like plot summaries or anything like that. It was just that I was I had seen other Michael Haneke films and then this was the next one on the list and I just sat there for like 10 minutes afterwards just feeling something like just like a yeah. void you know it's like it's you know I don't really feel sad or you know uh, overwhelmed by like you know pathos but it's there's something really troubling about the whole the the gravitational quality of of the story that they're just like this is the logical outcome in fact you know what it reminds me of a little bit now that I think of it <clears throat> is um like high rise not so much the the adaptation but the the novel like and, and that's like in the novel it, the 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 descent of the tower block into self destruction and violence is presented as a as a logical uh course of action in the face of the irrationality mm-hmm. of modernity um and the seventh um, the the Ben Wheatley adaptation kind of changes that a little bit and turns it more into like a class mm-hmm. warfare kind of thing um but the the seventh continent is like that it's like this is this makes sense. This is not that it makes sense to the viewer, but to the to the characters, it's presented as this is. A, I mean, as you say, like the, they they plan this for three years. Like, you know, it's like planning a wedding or planning, you know. Um, but it's 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 also, I mean, suicide is the the ultimate rejection of social mores, right? Like, um, and it's the ultimate rejection of narrative, even. So, on the once on the one hand, we've got this film which seems to sort of. Uh, tr- uh, kind of grind along its own through its own compulsive uh, engine, and on the other hand, the logical endpoint of it is this complete rejection of narrative. And so, as you said at the end, what else is there to feel other than this profound sense of like nothingness? Just like, I mean, it's it's. I think a phrase that you mentioned to me uh, when we we're exchanging briefly opinions about angst. Recently, is the uh, was it the the banal nihilism that's contained in a film like The Seventh Continent? Um, yeah. And you know, I think I I remember I haven't seen, again I haven't seen this film in years either, but I remember feeling very much the same at the end of Twenty Nine Palms, the Bruno Dumont film. Um, right, right. Yeah. Which has again, it's a kind of a, it's a film that emphasizes everyday banality, right? 
and yet it has this kind of dreadful undercurrent throughout the film, um, even before its horrific, well, horrific climax. That was another one that left me stunned. Yeah, uh, but not not that I I liked it as much as I like the Seven Continent. I think it's a, it's a little bit. I mean, I think you could I think you could you know trim it down and make a, a really really excellent like eighty five yeah. minute film. It's like half an hour too long when we spend with these characters, but. Uh, I would say that that uh, Bruno Dumont kind of perplexingly or suggestively uh, defines the 20, uh, defines Twenty Nine Palms as an anti capitalist horror film. Mm-hmm. So uh, that kind of it kind of ties in with the idea of like this being a logical or inevitable uh, outcome of living under these conditions. Um, it doesn't have the uh, sort of inexorable quality of Seventh Continent, though. It, it feels more like a random intrusion into their kind of uh, in, into the kind of it's almost like a purgatorial kind of existence yeah. that they have, uh, which is, pe- which and is meaningless. Pe- what is he doing? He's he's traveling around the like the Arizona oh, desert or something like that, and <laughs> he's photographing. Oh, but he's photographing something. He's photographing like telegraph poles or like pylons yeah. or something like that. He's making the, um, and it's just he's, this, uh, he's, <clears throat> he's making the kind of yeah. uh, film or portfolio that I would make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then they go back to the motel and they swim and then they go back out and they like, yeah. So event- eventually this, uh, will we, will we say what happens at the we end? We may as well, you know, um, may as well. Yeah. <laughs> we're spoiling every other film. Um, so, uh, so they're, they're in the desert and this, uh, these gang members arrive yeah. out of nowhere and they, again, and it's been, it's been 10 years since I saw this either, but my memory is that they, they restrain yeah. the woman while they rape the man. And then they leave them there, yeah, but they, they, and then they go off, and it's like a gang initiation. So, uh, they also uh, kind of beat them over the uh, head with uh, baseball bats as well, right? And then you think, "Wow, that was that came out of nowhere." And then they go back to the to the motel, and he has locked himself in the bathroom, and she's trying to get him to come out, and uh, then he bursts out of the bathroom, having shaved yeah. his head, and kills her brutally with a, yeah. with a knife. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I don't know. And all, like to, to to say this is an anti-capitalist horror film, it's it's just I don't know. It it it, it gives it it immediately infuses it with this very particular subtext. But it's not um, as if like the the preceding film that we just watched was like this, um, you know, lavishly produced like um, film with like comical elements. I mean, it's a kind of a the brutality's there anyway. I mean, it's structured into the, the very setting of the film from its title. I mean, you know, the Californian desert is just... Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's a brutal, yeah. arid, devoid place. Uh, a blank canvas. And the opening shot of the film, the opening shot of the film is uh, him driving with her asleep in the back and the way she's photographed, she looks like mm-hmm. she's dead. Uh, so like they're dead already yeah. kind of thing. Um, so talking briefly about angst and then Seventh Continent... Two films that are both uh, based upon actual events, let's say. Um, Mm -hmm. Another film that came to mind when watching both was Playground, a Polish film from last year, again, another debut feature by uh, Bartosz Kowalski. Um, Which hasn't been released yet. Which hasn't been released yet. Doesn't have distribution. Although the distributors, or the, sorry, the producers are apparently very ambitious about their their distribution uh, plans. Uh Aha, okay. Um, I, I don't see it getting a UK release. I also don't see it getting a UK release. I mean, it's been uh, almost a year since it had its UK premiere, I think, in London Film Festival. Um, That's not that unusual, though. It's not, it's not. But it hasn't really gained any traction on the in the festival landscape um, with no. regard to further prospects uh, commercially. But um, again, it's, it's a film that's, uh, let's say, informed very heavily by real-life uh, history. Um, in particular, the Jamie Bulger um, killing, mm-hmm. and also a similar um, murder which took place in Poland uh, more recently, in recent years. Yeah. Is that about fifteen years ago? The director said something about being inspired by something you read about fifteen years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and uh, it's a film in which, again, the everyday banalities that inform brutal, horrific acts acts is uh, emphasised. So it's a film that unfolds from the point of view of three uh, school children. Um, I, I think they're about twelve years old. They're twelve, yeah. yeah. 
because they're just finishing uh, primary school. Yeah, and it's structured um, by means of chapter titles named after each of the characters, right? So that we get yes. two boys and one girl, and it's four, there. F- there are four chapters. Four chapters. First three chapters are named after the three characters, and then the fourth chapter is is titled Ruins. Mm-hmm. And the three characters come from different social classes, uh, where the the girl is is a upper class, um, and then the boys are are middle class and working class. Um, yeah, I mean, and we get uh, little vignettes with each character demonstrating their kind of like their their social dysfunctionality. Mm. And again, it unfolds in a very sort of. Uh you know, identifiably Haneke-like fashion. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. this, fr- this kind of fragmentary uh, lack of explanation. I think one of the boys at one point inexplicably slaps his uh, father, who's physically challenged. Yeah, um, I actually I actually thought that was uh, really funny. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, I just thought it was... Uh, I thought it was um, so absurd. You know, because the scene, the scene plays out like... Uh, He's, you know, the dutiful son, yeah. and he's like helping his dad, and they're having their, they have this like nice rapport between them and stuff. And he get, he gets him out of bed, and he brings him to the toilet, yeah. and then he brings him into the kitchen. He makes him a sandwich just the way he likes it, and then he brings him back to bed, and he puts on his music, and then he just suddenly starts slapping him in the face. Yeah, uh, which gives us two things, I suppose. It, it demonstrates the the boy's capacity for inexplicable acts of violence. Right. And it also foreshadows the film's endpoint, and we should note that the film, the whole film, is structured around its endpoint, and it's 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 the it's the the inspiration mm-hmm. for the film anyway. So you know, another film I'm going to spoil, yeah, uh, for listeners. Um, it's as I said, it's it's based heavily upon uh, the, the the 1993 murder of two-year-old James Bulger in, in Liverpool, um, which. I think was the first point at which uh, the the British public became aware of uh, like CCTV, like as mm. a as a as a broad like broadly used thing in society, and I think it, mm-hmm. in that like you know haunting footage of the real life victim being led through a shopping mall by two young boys, two young boys about to commit this inexplicably heinous act. Um, yeah, who by, who, who by the way were younger than the characters in the story. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So these characters are aged up slightly. Uh, I think I think they were ten. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but um, I think that that the CCTV thing helped uh, or intensified the horrors uh, of the case. Um, and there's this, you know, I don't know what you thought about the film. Uh, I, I was watching it at Warsaw Film Festival last year, uh, and it's kind of impossible to go into this film without knowing how it ends, uh, because it comes right. with that kind of baggage. It's one of those films, um, and and so it, it it seems kind of facile and redundant to stress that it's got this air of inevitability about it, because you know what's going to happen. But the film, right. in in how it unfolds, again with the chapter titles and the, and the sudden switch from. Chapter name, chapter titles named after characters to the fourth chapter being titled Ruins. It's like, mm-hmm. well, here we go. This is it. You know, this is what we've been waiting for. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll come clean with you. I didn't like the film at all. You didn't like it at all. Uh, no, I didn't like it okay. at all. And the main reason is is what you just said. This this idea that the final uh, uh, the final uh, events are are at all uh, inevitable or. Uh, put into some kind of like adequately explanatory context by what he dramatizes prior to that yeah uh like what we're shown are for example the the scene i would say that that scene is probably the moment where i turned against the film and thought that this is just ridiculous scene? the scene where he slaps his father uh-huh. uh i thought it was unintentionally hilarious and um not psychologically convincing at all yeah. um uh, but is it not what violence is? It's psychologically, you know, unconvincing. No, I don't. I don't think so. all violence is, is psychologically unconvincing. But I'll come back to that in a second, okay. uh, because the other things that were shown are like one of the kids burning ants, and another kid tormenting a dog, and then finally they escalate to bullying the girl. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and is that supposed to? Uh, what what is what is the purpose of that? It seems like it's 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 neither 
uh, doing what, for example, Gus Van Sant's Elephant does, which it, you know presents a lot of different possible sort of uh, not so not so much possible uh, catalysts, but uh, popular scapegoats for the Columbine shootings, yeah. and puts them all in there. Like then, yeah, so that they all become <clears throat> symptoms within this kind of uh, confrontation of. The narrative around Columbine. So we've got bad parenting, video, ga- violent video games, something yeah. as banal as the fluctuations in the weather, uh, suggestions right. that were made at the time of uh, like homosexuality between the yeah. killers. Yeah, and some, they're they're also watching a documentary about Nazism yeah. or, or World War Two or something like yeah. that. The guns are readily available yeah. to them through them through the post. So it's a very sort of like that. elephants are very sort of uh, intelligently constructed reading of the discourse around the event. Rather I than think I think so. The yeah. Itself. Yeah, I think so, and I don't think Playground is. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, I mean, did you find... Because like, those, 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 those moments when, when they, they torment the animals mm. felt... Or, or even the fact that, that he watches the dog through his, his phone, you know, and it's like, oh, he's disconnected from reality, and it's all, you know... And then later on he films the girl being bullied. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, I just... They, I found them very obvious, uh, symbolically. We're going to get into... into uh, another film in a few minutes where the opposite is true I think but in this case I don't think what's the name of the director uh, Martosh Kowalski Kowalski, Kowalski. Um, I don't think he he does any work there I don't think he, he creates any kind of like uh, potent striking symbolic resonant suggestive imagery on any level at all with one exception and that is the in the opening segment with the girl she boils the kettle and then takes a gulp of boiling water and holds it in her mouth. Uh-huh. That's the only image in the film where I was like in, suddenly intrigued by the characters' behaviors. Uh-huh. Otherwise, it felt obvious and and banal to me. And then suddenly, you get to the point where you're like, "Oh, okay, now it's now it's the James Bulger case." Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, what do you make of that? Um, that weirdly, where where he breaks the otherwise controlled sense of. Um, let's say, detachment, um, and we get that slow motion shot of the two boys walking down the street. Uh, it's like this fantastical image of, uh, oh, yes. of the yeah, yeah. people kind of, you know, society at large kind of looking mm-hmm. at them very accusingly before they've even done anything despicable. Right. Um, what do you make of that? Yeah, that was, I, that's, I forgot about that one. That's that's not too bad either. Um, but yeah. Uh, but we should say... Again, he, again he, has to, he has to break the... the the f- form of the rest of the film to, to put that in there. Yeah. Um, whereas I think he, he organically works in that, that scene near the beginning with the, with the boiling water, uh, which is a really, I, I thought it was a fantastic, image yeah. or a fantastic moment where you, you really want to know more about this girl. And it turns out that she's kind of inconsequential to what ultimately happens. She anyway. is, she is, she's a uh, kind of used um, and very cynical, uh, Mi- Mikaelina Swiston is, uh, plays Gabrisha and, uh, she is, I agree, kind of the most compelling character in the film, almost. Uh, yeah. Certainly the best actor as well of the three. Um, but then she's kind of cynically dispatched uh, in narrative terms when the film no longer needs her. Um, and we do descend into, uh, you know, metaphorical ruins, if you like. Um, because a large part of why this film is kind of prompts disgust and comes with warnings and apologies is because of its final scene, uh, which is a... Right. You want to describe it? Um, it's it's a scene in which the, the two 12-year-olds... So let's talk about the, the preamble to it first. So they, they after they've tormented... Sorry, let's let's go back a little bit. Um, so you, it's the last day of school, and uh, what's her name? Gabrisha. 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 She is uh, in love with one of the boys, and she's decided to take this opportunity, her last opportunity on the last day of school, to tell him how she feels about him. And uh, she gets some advice from one of the more popular girls in the school about what to, to basically blackmail him into uh, meeting her at these literal ruins, yeah. uh, this uh, like derelict building in the middle of nowhere. And uh, the, he goes there, his friend comes with him, and he tells his friend to kind of hide and, and wait for him. He goes in, she tells him how she feels, and he rejects her and then uh you know he, then he calls his friend over and they torment her and they they tease her and they film everything and, and you know and then that's the end of her story yeah and then you follow the two kids and i think it's at that point that you get the the uh kind of uh the slow motion shot the slow motion yeah. shot with the the accusing, and then accusing the people most banal and familiar everyday setting possible uh the shopping mall 
Yeah, uh, and they they spend their their you know they they uh, they hang out there and then doing doing nothing in particular. And then the sequence ends with um, <clears throat> them picking up, uh, kind of taking this boy, this much younger boy, um, mm-hmm. holding him by the hand, leading him down. I think an escalator, and it's yeah. it ends with a cut to black of the kid looking back. And we know mm-hmm. that there's no way back at that point, and it's you know it's going through the motions, and we know that we have to now endure something that's going to probably be very horrible, and it is very horrible, mm-hmm. and it's a long take, yeah. um, and it's a long shot, strategically long shot, framed framed in such right. a manner because it's a long shot, and it lasts for I think it's eight and a half yeah. minutes. The shot is eight and a half minutes. And it's by some real weird tracks, you know, the, the, the kind of yeah. details that it's... very closely resemble the actual uh, murder. And they they even, they even have when when they they have a. a it's kind of a slow montage of him, him being led through the streets mm-hmm. by the two boys, and they're they're obviously taking him quite a distance, yeah. and he's tired, and they have the same uh, which which also happened in the James Bulger case where a stranger was like stra- strangers stopped and asked what was going yeah. on, and the kid was kid was crying and stuff, and the the boys managed to convince the passersby that uh, he was their younger brother and that they were taking him home, yeah. uh, and you see that as well happening, and somebody on a bicycle stops and. Uh, confronts the kids. You don't hear it again. It's in long shot, yeah. and um, you see that they're kind of like trying to, you know, convince him that everything's okay. Yeah. And the, the kid is too tired to walk, so one of the boys picks him up, and then they continue, and then eventually they get they get to the train tracks, and then you get this this setup. It's the penultimate shot of the film. It's eight and a half minutes, uh, and uh, it is really really horrifying. Uh, but even though it is horrifying. I don't think it's effective at all because, uh, and I would I would compare this to um, the Austrian film about the the pedophile with the with the kid in the in the dungeon uh, called Michael Marcus uh, Schweinsler, is it? Yeah, twenty twenty eleven film, one of uh, Michael Haneke's uh, proteges. Um, th- what happens is that in the long shot, you have the three figures in the middle distance. Yeah, and for the first three, four, or five minutes of the shot, um, you, ac- you are accepting them as three real people. Yeah. And then suddenly, the two boys brutally attack the kid. Yeah. They kick him in the head, they stamp on his head, and then eventually they smash his head in with a rock. Yeah. And at that moment, I'm thinking, wait, how did they do this? Like, what's, and, and then you realize, okay, the, all through the thing, the kid is CGI. And you're, I, for me, I was just like, I was thinking, I was totally just thinking about the technique and like how they, how they achieved that shot. And I, I, the reason I bring up Michael is there's a similar shot um, where the, the uh, again, I hesitate to say protagonist, but the subject of the film, Michael, um, is having, he, he has the, his prisoner have dinner with him every night and they sit at opposite ends of the dinner table. And at one point he, sa- he asks the kid, oh, do you want to see something? Yeah. Uh, so you want to see something funny or something like that, and he takes up and he exposes his genitals to the kid, yeah. and I was like, "Wait, what? <laughs> How do they do that?" You know, and it turns out that it was done with split screen, and uh-huh. like the, the kid was at one end of the table with nobody at the other end, and it's two two shots spliced together. Um, did you not? Did you feel that? That were you were you emotionally involved in the scene, or um, were you? I uh, don't think I was jarred into kind of like I don't think I. Dis- I mean, dispassionate by that reflection. point, I was kind of repulsed by the film anyway because I think it's structurally set up in such a way that um, it is kind of exploitative uh, I, I don't know if being kind of intrigued by the techniques is necessarily a, a detriment to the emotional content of the film or the emotional intentions of the film because for instance something like Irreversible uh, which inevitably comes up again and again in these kinds of discussions you know, that fire extinguisher scene at the very beginning of Irreversible, uh, in many mm-hmm. ways, kind of more shocking than the rape scene that happens later on in the film. Uh, watching that, I'm kind of like subsequently, uh, simultaneously, sorry, horrified by what's going on and also trying to figure out how they did it. Um, but is it, well, I, I, don't, I don't so much mean, like, yeah, I know what you mean, but the, uh, with Irreversible, you, for me, I know that like in, in the shot where he's going to cave the guy's head in with a fire extinguisher, I know that they're going to use some sort of prosthetics or something like that, whereas I'm saying that like, this is, if, if, if it hadn't been a single shot, I wouldn't have felt this way. Yeah. But it's it's that I'm sitting here watching for four or five minutes 
what I assume to be three actors. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, two of the actors brutally murder one of the other actors yeah. who is a child uh, in a way that is not, you know, stageable with an actual child actor. Yeah. So I felt I felt kind of jarred into, um, you know. What about that? Another Gus Van Sant film? What about in a completely different uh, situation? What about in Jerry when uh, Casey Affleck's stuck on the up on the high rock and he can't get down? He's going to have to jump down, and that's filmed in a similarly detached long long frame, uh, and he eventually jumps down from this rock and it's higher than you think it was and you know it was done through cgi but obviously very very different uh example yeah i, I don't know um do you think do you think playground crosses a line ethically uh i would hesitate to say yes because i think it's, it's a bit of a slippery slope yes um but like is it is it possible to make a film on the subject of just sorry it isn't on the subject of James Bulger. No, 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 of course it's not. No, 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 it's not. So is it possible to make a film inspired by something like that? Uh, I would say yes. Yeah. Um, if the film ended, if, if if it weren't for that eight and a half minute penultimate shot, yeah. how would you have felt the same way if it had ended with them just leading him into down toward the train tracks? I mean, like, uh, the film kind of doesn't mean anything really otherwise. Um, I'm not, I'm, but it would it would be what what it would already have implied the the conclusion. Yeah. So you you would just fill in the blanks yourself. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I don't think I mean I think the film would just, people would shrug it off to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one one thing that I was thinking about when I was thinking about the ethics of it is that it seemed very unlikely to me that anybody uh, personally connected with James Bulger would ever hear of the existence of the film. And then I googled it, and there's an article in the Daily Mail where uh, Bulger's mother is speaking out against the there film. Is? So really? wow. Yeah, yeah. Somebody informed her of its existence. Wow. Like I'm sure she didn't uh, I mean it, yeah, it comes so. back to that what we were talking about with regard to Seventh Continent and Angst and, and this idea that, you know, some acts of brutality are kind of ultimately and inevitably kind of if not impossible, extremely difficult to understand. Um, and to explain yeah. in social terms how something like that can happen. Uh, or psychological terms, something like that can happen, which I can understand. I can see, I can understand Kowalski's uh, approach, and I can see things happening, like the the young boy hitting his father inexplicably. Like, I just find, like you, I just found it a, a, a kind of cliched, really. I, mm -hmm. Like, the, it's kind of a damning assessment of a film like this that. He's made a he's made a tedious film about an exceptional thing. Yeah, but it's boring. Thing. Yeah, it's yeah. boring, boring for boring for an hour, and then yeah, um, you and know, I, and I, in, inevitable to the point of further boredom for the remaining twenty minutes. It's true. I should say it's only 70, 77 yeah, minutes yeah, or something. It's a very long uh, seventy-seven minute film. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I was going to bring up uh, compliance. Yeah. The the twenty twelve film by Craig uh, Craig Zobel, yeah. I think his name is. Uh, he. Uh, bases this on true events to to the extent that that many critics said that you know this should be a documentary what's the point in doing something that so slavishly sticks to the to the real events if if uh you know you may as well just do it as a documentary mm -hmm. uh but okay so the the premise of that film is that there is and it's based on a true story that the uh there was a guy who was uh cold calling various different restaurants all over the country and he was pretending to be he's pretending to be a cop yeah. isn't he and he's he's saying that he's saying to the manager that they suspect he's basically doing a kind of a cold reading thing where he doesn't have any, any information about the people who are working in that place, uh, and he, um, you know, eventually gets somebody's name and he says, "Oh, that's her." You know, um, he's saying that somebody working there, one of the employees, is suspected of theft or drug dealing or something like yeah. that, and that they're, the police are on the way to, and it's up to the manager to hold her there, and make sure she doesn't leave, and basically it. Uh, like the film is called Compliance, and it's all about the, you know, people's uh, tendency to comply with uh, authority figures, and it, uh, you know, escalates and escalates and escalates, and eventually it culminates in uh, an instance of sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And um, what is interesting about it is that, I mean, I on the one hand, I I heard people saying, oh, this should be a documentary, but on the other hand, I said, you know, if this weren't based on true events, it would feel completely implausible. Yeah. Um, but I felt that in that film, 
I, I felt I, there was a certain point where I was, I was like, okay, I can see how somebody would follow along with these instructions and be afraid of losing their job. Cause he does, when she, when she pushes, when the manager pushes back a little bit against him, he, he does say, okay, well, I'll, I'll get onto the head office then. Yeah, you know, and she, she goes, oh, okay. Uh, so he's, he's expertly manipulating them. He knows where their, their, their weaknesses are and everything. Um, but it was not the first time he'd done it. Mm-hmm. So he had, he tried it lots of times before with different restaurants and it had always got to a certain point, but it had never gone any farther. Mm-hmm. And with this one, it goes farther. It goes as far as it could really conceivably go. And at a certain point when I was watching it, I was like, no way this happened like this. Mm-hmm. There's no way. So I, I looked up the, the real events and he did change two things, two really crucial things. Which were? Uh, which were the personalities of two of the characters. So in... <laughs> If you look up, so in the film, uh, the the woman who is abused, the young woman yeah. who who's just like one of the counter staff, yeah. uh, she is kind of uh, she's kind of sassy and confident and and extroverted and you know independent yeah. and and outspoken. And in reality, the woman who was sexually abused was not any of those things. She was she was the opposite. She was shy and introverted and timid and you know. Uh, and you, you can it, it just it makes a lot more sense. Plus, the guy who sexually abuses her in the film is presented as like kind of dim-witted and yeah. uh, slovenly and kind of like doesn't really know what's going on. And he's kind of like stumbled into this situation and he's kind of like semi-consciously, opportunistically taking advantage of it and kind of just like following his his baser instincts. Mm-hmm. In rea- in reality, the guy was like like a really calculated predator. Um, and you, you change these two personalities. Yeah. I don't know why he did. So they're already, because it, it just they're all, all of these real life characters are already halfway into falling into this uh, setup anyway. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is that yeah. So what I'm saying is that the the social and psychological and um, institutional chemistry of that situation is so precise yeah. that it can't be altered. And I think in a situation like the and again, I know that that playground is not explicitly based on the James Bulger case, but it evokes yeah. it. Um, that's another situation where if you're gonna you're gonna treat it, you have to treat the very specific circumstances, because it's even even with those, even with all that information, it's still incomprehensible. Yeah. You know, and and you don't go, you can't alter it and like add these characters and change the personality and make the kids older and transplanted from England to Poland and you know change all these little details and still kind of constantly refer back to it uh, as though you're commenting on it in some way yeah, as if, because it is another situation where it's just like this is a one in a million yeah, situation you can just telegraph something wholesale to a t- completely different uh, social makeup let's say yeah. fabric um, because in doing so the intricacies have to be changed also um, mm-hmm. I see what you mean I mean uh, uh, maybe it's maybe it's a good point to, to segue into a discussion about Fulham that isn't based upon any explicit, uh, explicitly real uh, case or event or actuality, but nevertheless, uh, through timing, uh, has caused its own controversies um, with regard to things happening in real life. Nocturama yeah. uh, by Bertrand Bonello, uh, which premiered last year. It's just been released, I think, on Netflix yeah. uh, in the UK and Ireland. And uh, this is a this is a film that I've seen twice recently, and I went into it first time. Uh, I was eager to get in on the discussion that was happening around it, um, and so I watched it. A uh, very bad streaming link, actually. Um, kind of struggled with it, I must say. Um, I thought it was very beautiful, and I didn't think a film like this should be beautiful. Um, and then I rewatched it uh, on the big screen uh, a couple of weeks ago in Bulgaria. And um, I was discussing it with a, 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 an Italian colleague of mine who, who already loved the film very much. And it's one of those films that in, in the process of discussing it, I came to really kind of admire its intelligence. Um, I don't think it's critic proof. I don't think it's structured in, in such a way. Um, but it does come close to that, I think. Um, and it's one of these films that it's extremely uh, intelligently... Uh, ambiguous let's say and it satis- it prompts and satisfies many many different interpretations so it's a film in which uh, a group of young multiracial uh, multi-classed youths let's say in Paris in the first half of, of 
first half of the film coordinate and orchestrate a series of explosions in Paris. Um, you can see why this has been a contr controversial film. And then in mm -hmm. the second film, after the attacks have been carried out, they hold themselves up in um, a kind of a department store uh, overnight in the hope, when it's off hours, in the hope that come morning uh, they'll be able to just kind of... Uh, you know, go back into society and go about their business and they will uh, elude um, being caught. That's kind of it. That's yeah. the premise of the film. Did you like it? I liked it a lot, yeah. Uh, I was kind of kind of wavering on it a little bit. Um, I think the scene where I decided that I, that I really liked it was uh, when they watched the first news broadcast about what they have done. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's set to a... Uh, they're, they're playing... It's not Willow Smith. It's a remix of a Willow Smith song of "Whip Your Hair Back and Forth" mm -hmm. uh, by by some rapper. I forget her name, uh, but I just thought the the juxtaposition of of that song and the and that uh, imagery was. I, I spoke earlier about about Playground about um, I've forgotten the director's name again. Kowalski. 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 Not discovering any uh, interesting, um, potent images or sound image combinations or juxtapositions uh, in his scenario but Bonello, like as the only other Bonello film I've seen, except, actually I've seen the uh, short film from this year as well, the Sarah Winchester Ghost Opera, uh, but the only other feature that I've seen is House of Tolerance which I loved, which was my favourite film of uh, 2012 um, but in as, as in that film <clears throat> you know, he has a relatively limited uh, scenario in terms of you know uh, it was all set inside a brothel, and this one is mostly set inside a, a shopping center. Uh, but he finds so many powerful images, and um, that was really the first one that, that struck me. I mean, again, uh, the reason that we've kind of the discussions led to this film, I think, is harking back to angst and Seventh Continent and playground films that are based upon reality in some way. Um, this isn't. And I think a lot of the controversies surrounding it have been, you know, with the, with the attacks on Paris and the terrorism, it, it, you know, that's happening and permeating society at large. You know, what happens when you make a film that's kind of like this, that is deliberately sort of anti-psychological in terms of its explanations in, about the, the, the social roots of terrorism? Yeah. Well, they just, they just say that it was this was something that they had to do, yeah. but they don't they don't say why. Uh, do you read, I mean, do you read the film as like a commentary on like uh, youth? Because it's certainly not one on terrorism. No, I think it's a yeah. I mean, I think that the film evokes themes of of uh, alienated youth and, uh, you know. Like like what I said about, or what uh, Bruno Dumont said about um, Twenty Nine Palms, that it was an anti capitalist horror mm -hmm. film. Once you once you take Nocturama as being an anti capitalist film, mm -hmm. all of these provocative kind of uh, all all the imagery and the scenario itself takes on uh, new layers of meaning. Um, but would you say that you're interested in in the comment that a filmmaker is making? Oh, I think. Ineluctably, I get dragged into uh, such approaches, um, and I actually I, res I, I resist it. And I actually would like to learn how to resist it more. Teach me how to resist it. <laughs> uh, I mean, like, because the reason I asked is because if it is a if it is a comment uh, on youth, I find it a very troubling one, a very kind of cynical one. The fact that their downfall, they usher in their own downfall, uh, and like the subject of angst. Are a little clumsy in there in following through with their intentions, uh, mm -hmm. and you know they 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 flout their own rules. You know they've got the, they've got these this strict you know code of conduct that they at the first sign without any sort of like um, you know they haven't been in the department store for long before things start to go wrong, and like they you know they're leaving the building which they agree not to do, uh, mm -hmm. you know all of these different things, and I think I mean. What is it kind of saying? I mean, it has to be saying something. I mean, not necessarily 
I'm not necessarily interested in finding out what Benello thinks of youth. I'm sure he's on our side right. uh, in general. Um, but but does, does, would it matter if he wasn't? <sighs> well, on the one hand, I don't need to know what he thinks. Okay, but on the right. other hand, the film, I think, uh, one once you begin to read it as as a statement on something, then. But must you read it as a statement? <laughs> I mean, if it, if it isn't one, then what is it? I mean, it's many things at once, of course. Even if it is a statement, it's not just a statement, of course. Uh, and I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little suspicious still of films that are engineered to provoke reactions. Um, by reactions, I don't mean like being repulsed in the way that you are with playground. I mean like responses. And ideological interpretations and interpretations of content um, that, uh, you know, there's no kind of wrong or right way to read this film and it satisfies several at once. Um, I think there's a there's a certain intelligence to be had formally there in constructing it in such a manner. But I'm still trying to process what it means to be that kind of filmmaker. But is, is the opposite not didactic filmmaking yeah i mean so like for instance um at the time of recording well, the, op- the opposite is something like uh hanukkah's funny games which is okay it, like it just it really boils down to a statement mm. that hanukkah himself has has verbally expressed you know obviously much more efficiently than spending two years making a film sorry spending four years making the same film yeah. twice um you know if your film is is reducible to a to a statement then I mean, you know, or to, or to a message or to an argument, yeah. there are way more efficient ways of making that. Like you might as well, you know, like from, from tweeting it yeah. to writing an essay about it, you know, it's weird, it's easier it's to write, weird, a, write a book. It's weird has even expressed as much to you, uh, as you, sorry, not to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he's even said, you know, if, if uh, what was it? I think it was in regard, with regard to Code Unknown. He said, mm-hmm. if you can make a, oh, yeah, if yeah. you can make a build. And, a, and, if, and hidden as well. If you can build a table in a certain way or something, uh, I forget. I completely forget the analogy. Oh no! Is this is this about being a being a hat maker? I don't know. I have and, no idea. And people, he, the reason the reason that he's never made comedy is that uh, he's a hat maker. He makes hats, and <laughs> you can't ask a hat maker to make shoes. He said. Well, that. No, apparently, his new film, his new film is uh, Happy End, is a is a kind of a dark comedy. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I, I see what you mean. I mean, like at the time of recording here, it hasn't been published yet. But the, the long discussion I had with my Italian colleague in Bulgaria. Um, was asking the same kinds of questions and we'd actually see later on that week at the same film festival a film uh, co- uh, scripted sorry, by Paul Laverty, Ken Loach's collaborator and it's directed by uh, Isier Bolain and these two had collaborated twice previously and the film is The Olive Tree, Spanish production and like mm-hmm. that's a film that isn't ambiguous in any way in its dramatic setup. Um, and it's about you know it's an anti-corporate film. It's an anti. It's a feel-good anti-capitalist film. And I actually mm-hmm. don't think an anti-capitalist film should be a feel-good one. Um, and it's very very neat in its narrative resolutions. Um, and a large part of its feel-good nature is the fact that we can all watch it, get a little angry while watching it, and then you know uh, leave the cinema and think, well, you know that was a heartwarming tale. I actually think it's the opposite to what Nocturama is. And to answer your question, yes, I did find it kind of uh, a terrible film. So I don't really know what I'm asking for from a film like Nocturama. I certainly wait. Are you sorry? Are you saying you found Nocturama to be a terrible film? No, 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 no. I think no. I oh, it. sorry. The Olive Tree. Film. Okay. Just, I I feel the need to. Wait, so, so the sorry the Olive Tree. Then you're saying yeah, very much. Okay, sorry. In the same way that I felt that I Daniel Blake was a terrible film. Um, where ah, it's it's difficult to explain, but like I'm just I suppose I'm just trying to couch my enthusiasm for Nocturama with the kind of self-interrogating devil's advocacy. Yeah, I mean it is difficult to put into words once you uh, once you reject the idea that you can boil the film down to words. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of inevitably makes it difficult to put it into words. But I mean, I think I like I think you probably agree and I think most people if they think about it would agree that films are primarily aesthetic experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean without that and this reason that like Playground is not a good film is because as an aesthetic experience it's just empty. Um, yeah. But Nocturama is not. Nocturama is is really compelling on a on a on the level of of um of like on a filmmaking level. Oh yeah. Like the same way that you would you would say like a you know a writer 
has great ideas maybe or you know makes all the right political points but uh, at a sentence level their writing is not aesthetically pleasing to read yeah. and if it's not aesthetically pre- pleasing to read then why would you read is it that a, you know you can get that the, a dig you, you, you know. is that a dig at me <laughs> <laughs> um well, uh, you know like the are, are you just looking for are you watching a film just to, so that you can boil it down to information um no, but this is this is where it gets so. complicated. And, and, and I'm sorry, and, and and also is is the relationship between you and the film more or less important than the relationship between you and the filmmaker? Is the is the film just a, a proxy for a dialogue between you and the filmmaker, or yeah. can you just forget about the filmmaker and take the film as an artifact and interrogate your emotional relationship with the film as an object? I think that's a it's a di- it's a it's a discussion I think that is kind of central to any sort of critical endeavor and it's one that I'm it's 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 one that I'm constantly negotiating and fluctuating around um sometimes I and it depends on the film and the filmmaker and the, and the intentions I think I think it's perfectly legitimate to feel or to want to feel a certain uh level of understanding from the filmmaker as well as the artist um, and it's also perfectly legitimate to kind of cast them aside. But, you know, I think films and artists exist in uh, social, you know, history, real life, and so we can't really deny that or ignore it. Yeah. Uh, I, w- I would also say that, um, you know, in, in um, rhetoric and in philosophy, there is a principle of, of good faith mm-hmm. where you, you don't assume the worst intentions of the the person that you're reading um and it, and i i mean I, I think that probably carries over logically into literary criticism but it for some reason seems to have been abandoned in contemporary film criticism yeah. that in, instead you like the principle is the principle of bad faith yeah. wow is that, and you is that another dig at me <laughs> <laughs> um but uh there, that that does seem to be. I, mean, I think it leads in, into in like the white... it's not it's not it's not a film criticism thing. It's a it's a it's a contemporary so, uh, social media culture. It definitely kind of is, and it's uh, it's heading the way. Uh, it's it's heading in a kind of down an unpleasant path, I think, whereby we need and expect art to be uh, progressive statements. Um, yeah, and we need them to be kind of explicitly uh, reducible to such. Um, right. At the same time, I think, isn't it part of a wider sort of culture with regard to, you know, securing more jobs for women in the film industry, for instance, or that that aren't just like, you know, playing, you know, dialogue-free objects? Um, Do you remember a few months ago, the thing where Elizabeth Banks was delivering some kind of, she was, she was presenting an yeah. award or something like that, and she, she just took a shot at Steven Spielberg <laughs> out of nowhere. Yeah. And it was, um, Steven Spielberg has never made a film with a female lead. Yeah. And obviously immediately everybody was going, well, what about the color yeah. purple? And I mean, if you take lead to mean the single person who has the most screen time or who is the, the absolute primary focus of the film, yeah. then yeah, he doesn't have that many. I think, I think uh, Goldie Hawn and the Sugarland Express would qualify. But um, if you're talking about like leads, like in, in the conventional sense of a lead where you don't just have one, you have a couple... Yeah. Uh, you know, then certainly Laura Dern in Jurassic Absolutely. Park, and there are there are others yeah. throughout his his career. But yeah, I mean, even even Kate Capshaw or Karen Allen in the first two Indiana Jones films are co-leads with Indiana Jones. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So like, even even if the thing is, even if she was correct, even if uh, if it were true, let's say let's say it's true. I mean, like, isn't isn't it perfectly acceptable for a filmmaker to be drawn to stories about men? Where Spielberg is criticizable is as a, is as a producer who doesn't hire women yeah but as an artist who tells stories about men he should never be in a position where he has to think oh god my last two films were about men i better make a film about women. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that it's, seems it's, absurd it's to going me back to but the, as, uh... a, as a producer as, as somebody who who habitually who's been a producer for as, almost as long as he's been a director he's been a producer for 40 years producing other people's films how many female directors has he hired yeah that is a point of criticism for sure, but saying he's never made a film with a female lead, I don't think it's a valid criticism, uh, and I don't, I don't think that the implications of that, if, if that criticism is taken as valid, then the implications of that are really unworkable and untenable. Yeah, I'd agree. And it um, goes back to the uh, Haneke quotation, um, in, in which, you know, Spielberg's a hat maker, you know, you can't make him into a shoemaker. 
Jill, Jill, Schum- exactly. Jill I mean- Shoemaker. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 also um, it's also I think to perpetuate this idea that films have uh, a role to play in society in terms of being like something to aspire to or like the representation on screen representation is a thing that has consequences um yeah. now that's a that's a separate discussion entirely yeah um, and that's a very very complex discussion absolutely. that i think is treated as very simple absolutely because to to demand more or better representations of women within spielberg's mm-hmm. filmography for instance or anyone's filmography would yeah. be to subscribe to the viewpoints that Gus Van Sant's elephant is kind of confronting and rejecting and kind of ridiculing mm. the idea that, like, you know, violent video games lead to uh, boys going into a school and killing their uh, classmates. Right, which which actually refers back to the James Bulger case where uh, it came out that one of their, that John Venable's father had, had rented Child's Play 3. Yeah. Uh, and we don't know if if you watched it or not, but it it features an image of of a doll covered in blue paint, yeah. and then obviously they they tortured the kid with paint. Which um, which it seems very but kind that, of separate. But Child's, Child's Play three Child's Play three is rated eighteen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's not pitched at kids. And I do I do think like in relation. To, I don't know if you even see Wonder Woman this year. No, no. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of. <laughs> it's actually pretty good, but the the. Uh, the um, a lot of the buzz around it at the time was related to uh, you know little girls dressing up as Wonder Woman and and this this picture went viral of of a kid kind of looking glowingly up at a like a huge standee of uh, Gal Gadot um, and I mean I think that when you're talking about kids yeah for sure I mean kids are are like impressionable and and representation should be a serious consideration for kids but. I also think that underlying all of that kind of conversation is some variation of the hypodermic effects model of, of audience theory, where audiences just kind of passively absorb all of these things on the screen and, and uh, you know, um, un- uncritically, you know, internalize it and then and, and actualize it in their lives, mm. which is, you know, at the very least, something pretty, that, pretty out of date yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and simplistic. Yeah, it's true. And again, what is what is the see? This is the thing with the Elizabeth Banks thing. What is the implication of what she's saying? Is she saying she's she's not arguing for some sort of like state-imposed uh, censorship of Steven Spielberg's films? Uh, but she does seem to be arguing for some kind of uh, un- informal shaming process, yeah. whereby he is like this kind of like Maoist struggle session kind of thing, where he's dragged out into the street and ridiculed and, and yeah. uh you know shamed until he goes god i really better make some more films with female leads yeah. you know um but uh i i'm sur- i'm in favor of of uh like the hiring quotas that yeah. like the, the dga suggests yeah. you know i i that's never going to come from the government and it would be preferable if it came from unions anyway but uh i think that's a really good idea yeah i think that's that needs to happen um but in terms of <laughs> singling out individual artists uh, because again underlying the whole thing I remember reading this in years and years and years ago uh, in an interview with David Cronenberg where he was because he's been coming under fire for that kind of stuff for a long time uh, going back to certainly as far as Dead Ringers um, and he said you know like it's just paralyzing to to art and to storytelling and to drama that any character that if you have a woman in your film she represents women mm-hmm. you know if you have a, a disabled person in your film, they represent disabled people, mm-hmm. um, which is there's no logical reason to to assume that. Like it's just presented as this kind of like truism, but it's it's mm-hmm. it, it's flimsy. Um, but it's, it seems to be premised on that kind of assumption that you know, uh, if you have a person who fits into a particular social category, then they must represent all people in that category. Yeah. Um, Whereas a character needs to just be a, an individual who is a character. And yet, to you know? go back to Lynch, if we may, to create some sort of aggregate of the female characters that appear in Twin Peaks and in his his filmography as a whole, one can sort of you know delineate a certain pattern 
Uh, I mean, does that then become a, a, a legitimate critical conversation or not? Only, only if we care about Lynch as a person. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I, I don't, I think. I mean, each film is individually just its own film. Yeah. Um, if we if we are really invested in psychoanalyzing David Lynch via his artistic output, then yeah, of course you can. You can. I'd, I'd still think it's dubious. I mean, I don't think you can, you know, psychoanalyze a person because of of the stories that they choose to tell. I mean, like you know, that that, that kind of cliche about like, you know, the happiest, cheerful, most cheerful comedians and stuff are the most like horrible people and, and the people who make the most horrible horror films like you know your Wes Cravens yeah. and your George Romero's and stuff there and Toby Hooper and like they're just they're just these the gentlest people in the world yeah. um you know so I mean like you know and, and also like that that kind of like simplistic or tourist idea of um you know the the great obsessive you know the, the obsessive filmmaker who who is kind of like singularly focused in in their life on a particular theme yeah. And that's what they're exploring. But in reality, like people are interested in all sorts of things and have all sorts of different sides to their personalities. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, somebody like a filmmaker like Sidney Lumet or someone like that is probably more reflective of the standard person. You know, It just happens to be reflected in their, their storytelling choices, yeah. whereas a lot of filmmakers tend to focus on... And par partly this is also due to kind of like the, the directorial uh, version of typecasting, yeah. where you can only get a certain type of film produced because that's what you first made your name yeah. with. Yeah, I mean, well, I wanted to make a comparison between five films, um, all based on the Ed Gein uh, true crime, the true, the crimes of Ed Gein. Uh, obviously, Ed Gein was a was a serial killer from Wisconsin in the forties and fifties, uh, and his crimes have been extremely influential in popular culture and in in uh, in film. And I was just going to ask you if you you take these five films, okay, so. Ed Gein from 2000, okay. Deranged from 1974, Psycho from 1960, um, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 1974, and uh, The Silence of the Lambs from 1991. They're all more or less inspired by Ed Gein. Um, and they're all horror films. None of them are like, uh, you know, social dramas about the reverberations throughout the community or the the effect that this had on the victims and their families and things like that they're lurid um you know freudian nightmares and do you think that there's a difference between say something like ed Gein, which by name mm. and i know you haven't seen it but like it's it's but it's you know the ed Gein story by mm. name and then you've got uh, deranged where it is the ed Gein story pretty much to the letter, but they've changed the character's name from Ed to Ez, yeah. and the rest is the same. <laughs> uh, and it even is even framed as a docudrama, where in the first half of the film, there is a uh, kind of unsolved mysteries type narrator who steps into frame and addresses the camera and says things like, you know, Ezra's mania didn't stop there, and you know, it's it's presented as this this recreation of real events. It sounds um, terrible. Is and it then terrible? at the end, it sounds terrible. Oh, it's it's fantastic. It I loved it. Oh, I loved okay. it. Absolutely adored it. Yeah. Um, but uh, the um, at the end of the film, it even has it even has the balls to have a disclaimer that says uh, the people and uh, events depicted in this film are entirely fictional, and any resemblance <laughs> to people living or dead is entirely coincidental. And I was thinking, come on now. <laughs> but then, uh, I mean, you can make a case for which of these films is closer to the real events between Psycho and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But I, I would say Psycho because Psycho has the thing with the mother. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it was made in 1960, it doesn't. It's not as uh, it's not as graphic and it's not as um, grisly. Mm -hmm. It's not as ghoulish as as the other films. Uh, so they take out the great. Well, I mean, he's supposed to have dug up his mother, but you know, they they don't have him like making furniture out of human body parts, or they take out the whole necrophilia thing yeah. and the the making a suit out of women's skin and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but then the mother thing is absent from Texas Chainsaw. Um, they do have the the elderly. The grandparents and yeah. stuff like that, but the the, the weird kind of uh, Oedipal um, necrophilic relationship with the mother is gone, and it, but it does have all the all the other stuff. It has Leatherface, it has the woman suit, it has the you know House of Horrors yeah. furniture made of bones and all that kind of stuff. And then at the end of that, you have Sons of the Lambs, where Buffalo Bill is 
not just inspired by Ed Gein, but also by Ted Bundy, by Jeffrey Dahmer, by, um, you know, like the whole thing. I think the whole thing where, you know, he, he fakes having a, a broken arm. He has his arm in a sling and he's trying to get a sofa into the back yeah. of the car. That, I think that was Ted, Ted Bundy used to do that. So he's a kind of a combination of uh, different um, 20th century serial killers. But the whole woman suit thing is, is from Gein. Um, and do you think taking them all as exploitation films, is there a difference? between doing at one end of the scale you have Ed Gein yeah. and then at the other end of the scale you have this loose third, fourth, fifth order inspiration uh, in Silence of the Lambs is there, is there an ethical question there? I mean uh, I think the silence with which I met your question <laughs> was telling, um, I'm still here um, I mean in theory no but I mean like do you if in theory no then can you theoretically you then apply that to across across the board i mean why does something like playground i don't think playground's primary problem or only problem where on is that, that scale it's tedious. where on the scale would you of, of those five films would you put playground relative to its uh its proximity to um the the james bulger case i mean because of the unique circumstances of the of the, 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 the details of the story, I, I put it pretty close, to be honest. I put it like neck and neck with Psycho. Yeah. Or something like that. It, it maintains the, the really the core element, but it changes a lot of other stuff. Yeah. It's not, it's not as close as Deranged is to Ed Gein. It's not like a recreation in all but name. Yeah. But it is clearly inspired by it. Whereas you could be familiar maybe with Ed Gein and... See Silence of the Lambs and maybe not pick up on that, but, yeah. uh, or maybe even Texas Chainsaw. I don't know, but the the mother thing is really the core thing with the Ed Gein story that makes it distinct from other kind of stories of necrophilia and, and grave robbing and things like that. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, angst adds a, goes so far as to add a, an internalized monologue, um, mm-hmm. which you know many many would argue is like kind of crossing the line. It's like you know cheapened tries to kind of psychologize uh, the unfathomable or the mindset of a killer, a psychopath. Um, as I said earlier, uh, about five hours ago now, <laughs> um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a integral part of the film structure and, and the various components that interconnect in its depiction and, you know, visceral experience. Um, well, how would, you, how would you feel if somebody made a film today uh, that was in all but name a dramatization of say like the Joseph Fritzl case mm. which Michael was interpreted as no? was it yeah the Austrian film yeah which which we mentioned earlier oh, I mean, okay it, it's, it's, oh, I see I see the comparison yeah you know, yeah okay. and it's I mean uh, you know Austrians have a very was that very, after the Joseph Fritzl case? Yeah, yeah 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 it was but it was pretty that must have been pretty soon after I mean it's it uh, 2011 yeah I mean it, some argued at the time that it was too soon after. Yeah, yeah, I would uh, thought so. Yeah. Austrians have a very strange relationship to their basements anyway, a very intimate kind of complex history, which is, uh, you know, expounded upon uh, by Ulrich Seidel in his film In Keller, um, which is about, you know, Austrians and their basements, basically. Um, but, like, here's the thing. Like, if you're going to make a movie about a serial killer, you're going to have murder... The, and again, obviously, the... the dramatization of murder no one's actually being murdered yeah and these these movies are hopefully not being seen by children yeah uh you know it seems like a it seems like a very dangerous slippery slope to me to start saying that you can't make films that are like okay you're not gonna you you, you know like the whole thing of uh like fargo or something like that where it's like it's not really based on true events at yeah. all but they say that it is and the names have been changed to protect well texas uh, texas chainsaw massacre also pr- <clears throat> has a prologue that is based upon like and these kids were Killed yeah, or something yeah. like that. You know, the events yeah. in this film are shocking, um, which actually helps to distance the fiction. I think it's. Uh, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, as we said earlier, with, with regard to playground, there's nothing in theory uh, inherently unethical about making a film about that kind of crime, uh, no. and I don't think anything should be off limits. Uh, but again, I'm, I, I hesitate to say that Playground's only problem is that it's tedious. Somehow, it, it, in, the, in the way it positions itself to that reality, I think is, is kind of, there's something that I need to kind of process there and to, mm. come to, and to come to terms with because for some reason that doesn't, 
it doesn't seem okay. On another level, angst does. So I mean, it's yeah, you know, it's, it's maybe maybe it comes down to uh, the 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 extent to which we the crimes in, depicted in one film are socially pervasive, and the and the crimes in another don't seem to be socially pervasive. They seem to be kind of unique and exceptional. Yeah, although you can make the same case for Ed Gein. Yeah, uh, but the do, do you remember? the James Bulger case no I mean come on I was like four years old weren't you six uh when was it 93 yeah yeah okay so five five years old because I remember it uh yeah I have I have very vague memories of something horrible having happened and of course it it wasn't just 93 like it went on for a long time it was it was was, yeah yeah. yeah. and I remember it more I remember more like it being part of the wide discourse like mm-hmm. you know and the kind of hysterias that an event like that inevitably uh, provoke and do you think that if we if we were from another part of the world that we wouldn't have the same reaction to playground like do you think a playground could play in japan or yeah, somewhere I like that of this, um you know if i watched sort of say a japanese film that's equally detached in the playground fashion that was about a local horrible case that had happened there mm-hmm. i think yeah, I think maybe I'd feel more qualified critically to accept it or to kind of yeah. em- embrace it as such because it doesn't seem part of my uh, cultural makeup. Yeah. But I, you know, it's it's how do we how do we detach ourselves from or distance ourselves from that kind of critical uh, positioning? I don't know. Well, I mean, what, what I was saying earlier would suggest that you shouldn't, you know, that if it's going to be a relationship between you and the and the film as an object, then that's what it's all about. Yeah, you know. Uh, I think I think you know the problem with playground is that, as you said, it, it's not emotionally affecting in any way. You know, it's kind no, of cynical. you're not emotionally involved by the time by the time you see it happening. Like, you, oh, okay, now we're now we're into the James Bulger recreation. Yeah. You're not you're not drawn in at that point. You're not really. And as I said, with regard to how it just dis- dismisses, you know, the young girl, she's a device, and as as, lo- as soon as the narrative no longer needs her. You know, we, we yeah. just forget about her. Um, and, and the death itself has no kind of consequence. I mean, it would be interesting if the film began with that as a, as a statement of intent, it began with the brutal depiction of a boy's murder and then dealt with the... Because that I think that's where the, the complicated, challenging that's stuff more, begins. That's a more story, yeah. yeah. I, I um, agree. Yeah. And then have to, having to kind of go back and investigate you know how something like that could happen because the film just because what they what they accomplish in the in the first hour in terms of uh you know dramatizing those kids relationship yeah. and getting inside their heads could just as well be established in the aftermath of what they do absolutely yeah um and it might not bring yeah. us any closer to a psychological understanding of what happened but the, the, the no but the social fallout is is yeah, what's interesting the about the structure of it becomes then more compelling um who knows? Okay, so this was uh, The Habitus, Michael Patterson here, and... Bobby Lowe. And please follow us on Twitter at HabitusPod. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.